my name is Tito Escobar. I work for Paradigm Traffic Systems. Uh, I've been with Paradigm for over five years now, uh, using the Conlight controllers, but before that, I was with the city of Houston as a timing engineer for 12 and a half years. So I have almost two decades of programming controller experience. NASTEC 900s, uh, next phase on 2070s, uh, some Enalite on 2070s, D4 on Cobalt controllers. So um, I'm not going to say an expert, but I can get through many different types of softwares. So what we're going to go over today with the kind of light controller is the basic setup. So if you get a controller, you pull it out of the box. How do I get this prepared to run a traffic cabinet so I'm running colors and I'm not in flash? How to set up preemption, how to do TSP, how to enable SPAT. So you can get anything going with the controller you need in order to run the intersection and interface with the applied information products. The kind of like Cobalt traffic controller is a great controller, number one, because uh, ease of upgrading the software, sharing files, downloading and saving files. You have a SD card port here. You have the uh, data key or you have USB, which is what I kind of prefer to do. So you could put a USB in here, save a timing file, give it to somebody else. They take it to another controller, put the USB in. You have your timing file there. No laptop needed, no software needed. The menu is set up really, really good. It's user friendly. You have the push keys that are really easy to use. Uh, your ABCD connectors, so you can go in TS1 or a TS2 environment. The controller pretty much does whatever you need to do as far as traffic is concerned. Okay, in EOS, one unique feature that we use with our customers pretty often, if you go from the main menu, one, three on logging, they have one that's called the VOIT feature. And if you toggle all the way down to the bottom of this screen, there is another one called this NTCIP SCP message. So if we have a customer who's having problems with the intersection, it's intermittently going to flash, they can't figure out what's going on. What we would do is we would tell them to go into this logging, turn on these features, and what they do is they basically take a recording of all the inputs and outputs the controller is receiving. Then once they have their next failure event, they go in here, turn that off, that kind of buttons up that file, they could save it on a USB and then email it to us and I can play it back on my laptop and see everything that was going on at the controller at the time. And I can actually rewind past the failure event, try to implement a fix and then play it to see if that fix solves the solution for them. So it's been paramount in helping us troubleshoot customer issues. Uh, TSP would, would pretty much be the ease of use. Um, from the main menu to get there, you're going to go to 4.3, and you have your strategy plans. So you have four different strategy plans that you can set up for your TSP. Uh, what you do inside the strategy plan is you enable all the phases that you want SCP to work with. What you pretty much do is if you have an eight-phase intersection, you want to turn on all eight of these. So you would go there like I'm doing here for number one and just put a yes there. Uh, another feature that they have is instead of just having SCP for that phase, you could go down here to where obstructing phase is. And uh, what just popped up here is called the transaction mode screen. If you make a change that is paramount to the operation of this, what it does is this screen just pops up and says, hey, you made a major change. Do you want to save that to the controller or do you want to clear it? So to save it, you'd hit special function and enter, and then you could just move on. But what you're doing is you're going down to the obstructing phase. And for phase one, if you have a short left turn bay and you want to do SCP to clear that left turn, the through traffic may possibly spill back and block access to that left turn bay. So I can go here where obstructing phase is and put in six. And now whenever SCP for one becomes active, it'll also bring up six green to help clear that queue so I can actually get my vehicle into that left turn bay. With the priority, the 1211 is a game changer because you don't have to use a hard preempt anymore. Uh, any timing engineer that does traffic knows that the preempt basically knocks out your coordinator, your coordination's gone, you're gonna kill whatever phase is active, you're going green for the preemption phase, and then once it leaves, you usually take a cycle or two to get back into step. With uh, 1211 and this T, uh, SEP plans that they have, it allows you to 
stretch the greens or shrink the greens so you can get green where you need to be for the approaching vehicle by the time they get to the intersection. So you get their ETA and then you start, you know, stretching or shrinking your splits to get to where you need to be. But doing that, you never leave coordination. So you remain in coordination. It doesn't affect your traffic moving throughout the corridor and you still accomplish moving that priority vehicle through the intersection. So first principles, when they come out of the box, they should usually be defaulted to the Econolite standard eight phase. Just to make sure if you ever get a controller, the easiest way to do that is to go to number eight utility, number one copy. And on this from column, you hit the zero key to place X by the L3000. You toggle to the right where it says active EOS config. Do the same thing and press enter. And what that does is it loads a Conolite's standard eight phase database onto the controller. So that way you have that on the controller and you know you're working from a clean file. Once you get that done, you go to configuration and go to cabinet and then go to cabinet type. So the first thing you wanna do is set up the controller for the type of cabinet environment you're gonna be placing it into. Uh, most of the customers use TS2 in Texas where uh, Paradigm does most of our sales. So it's defaulted for a TS2. It has both of the BIUs turned on and a detector BIU turned on. So from this point right here, this is ready to go. You can hit submenu and then check your load switch assignment to make sure that your load switches are operating where you want. Uh, most people do the, your vehicle phases one through eight line up with load switch one through eight. So that's the way the controller is defaulted. And then it has its pedestrian phases two, four, six, eight on nine, 10, 11, and 12. Now, some of our agencies like the pets to be on 13 through 16. So if we were setting that up right now, we would have to make that change, but we'll leave it here for now. So at this point, the only other thing you would have to do to get this controller to actually run a cabinet and not go into flash is go to number four, monitor programming. And in here, you have to copy the permissives from the MMU. If they don't match up, the controller will not allow the cabinet to run and you'll be in CVM flash on your uh, MMU. But if you toggle this to where it says copy mon and you press enter, it's not gonna do it on ours because we're not connected to an MMU, but it would copy all the permissives that are on the jumper card for the MMU. After that point, you should be able to run your cabinet. Now, the only thing that you may have in here well, here we're not connected to a cabinet, so we have failed detectors. So this will cycle through every phase. But if we're actually connected in a TS2 cabinet environment where it had good detectors, because we wouldn't have any calls here, you may not see it cycle. So at that point, if you wanted to see it cycle, what you need to do is play some recalls. So if you go back to your main menu and you go to number two, number one, and then number six, this is the screen where you could place a vehicle recall, which would be a minimum recall where the timer's using the min green, a ped recall, which brings the pedestrians up every cycle, or a max recall, which uses your program max values for your green. So what I would usually do if this was running on my desk or it's running in a cabinet and I'm trying to test stuff, I would put every phase that I have on minimum recall. And that will force the controller to continually time because it's not sitting in, for example, two and six with no calls anywhere else. The mapping phases, uh, back to main menu, number one, one, two, is right there, your load switch assignment that we just briefly discussed. That's how you map phases. So just for example, just to show a change, how I mentioned earlier, some people like to use their PEDs on um, 13 through 16. I can go here and the V is for vehicle phase, a P is for pedestrian phase, and an O is for overlap. I can hit the zero key to toggle that to a pedestrian phase. So I'm changing 14 through 16 to where they'll all be pedestrian phases. And then I'm gonna change the number assignment so it's calling PEDS two, four, six, and eight. And you see here, you go back into transaction mode because that's a major change. Now you can hit special function enter like I did before, but what I usually like to do if I know I'm gonna make several changes on the screen, you hit the F key clear, which keeps you in transaction mode. That's why that small T is 
uh, blinking on the screen, but it allows me to make several changes without getting that prompt every time I press a button and then having to save what I did. So now I can make all my changes at one time and just save it once at the end. But this would be where you alter a load switch assignment or phase assignment. Let's say if you wanted to put a phase eight on load switch nine, this is where you'd go to change it. To map detectors to the controller, you go back to your main menu, you go to number six detector. You go to number one vehicle assignment and you pretty much have everything there. They default this to where the first eight are mapped one to one. So you have detector one is phase one, detector two is phase two and so forth. And then you have some default settings that go all the way down to, I think it's about detector 24. What I usually recommend doing is any of these detectors that you're not using, even though they're defaulted here, I would zero them out. So for example, if I was setting up this controller, I would make all these other defaults besides my first eight zero. That way they don't show up as a failed detector and put in an unnecessary call. Another thing that's unique about the Econolite controller is if I wanted a detector to call more than one phase, it's very simple to do. That's what these arrays of dots are here for. All I'd have to do is toggle over there. And for example, if I wanted this detector one to call phase one and phase six, I just press a six. And now that detector is calling multiple phases whenever it's active. So that's a really nice feature. Uh, with the detectors, if you go submenu number two, you also have, these are, uh, this menu is called the vehicle options. So for every vehicle detector, you have several options of what you can do with that vehicle detector. You can lock it in yellow or red. You can set it up to uh, extend. You can actually delay the detector, which is common for detectors that are over lanes where cars uh, mostly turn right. So a lot of people will put like an eight second delay so you don't get a car that pulls up there, stops, and then leaves, and you basically serve the side street and it appears that nobody's there. So you have a whole list of options that you could do to get really fancy with your detectors. To map video detection to a controller, uh, most of the camera systems in the TS2 environment interface to the controller through SDLC cable. So you have an SDLC cable that will plug in from the cabinet to, for example, on the Econolite Autoscope Vision cameras, the comm manager, there's an SDLC port. So you would plug into there and then you would go to your programming on your cameras. So if I draw a loop and I tell the camera that that loop is going to be detector one, then I go into my controller here and I would just tell my controller what phase do I want detector one to place a call for. So setting up the cameras to interface with the controller isn't really a hard task. Most of the time it's just plugging in an SDLC cable. So fixed time operation, setting up a traffic controller for fixed time operation. Fixed time operation just means you don't have any detectors. So there's no actuations. Most of the time this happens in uh, central business districts, downtowns, for example, um, as I previously mentioned, I worked for City of Houston for 12 and a half years. We didn't use any vehicle detection in our CBD district downtown. So everything was fixed time. And pretty much fixed time operation, you would go to number two, number one, and then number six, where we were at before, and you just place recalls on all your, um, all your phases. So it would be up to you whether you'd wanna go with the min green or the max green. If I was doing a fixed time operation, most likely I would use the max green. Uh, most of the time that min green, that number is so low that you only get one or two cars through the intersection. So you would do that to basically place everything in the max recall. And then you would go from the main menu again, it'd be two, one, nine, and if you scroll down some, you see it starts at the top with the min greens, and then you have your pedestrian time down there, uh, your vehicle extension, and right underneath that, you have your max times. So I would just set those max values. For example, if I wanted phase one to get 15 seconds of green every time, I'd put a 15 in there. And as long as phase one's on max recall, every single cycle, phase one's gonna come up and get 15 seconds. So. 
The example that I spoke of, the CBD, usually those are two-phase signals because you have a couple of one-way arterials. So, for example, you'd have like phase two and phase four, and you just put in the numbers for the green for two and four, put them on max recall, and then you'd be running fixed time operation. For pedestrians on fixed time operation, it would just depend on your intersection. If you do have pedestrian push buttons, you can let those work actuated. Or what you can do, like I said, my previous experience with Houston, we didn't have any push buttons downtown either. So we placed those pedestrians on recall also. Uh, just one thing to note, if you are going to do a fixed time operation and you're placing your pedestrians on recall, you want to make sure that your phase time is enough to cover the ped. And what that means is if you see in here, uh, for example, here on the controller two, I have a walk of 10 seconds. I have a ped clear of 16. So that's a total of 26. If I go down to where my yellow and red clearance is, I have three seconds of yellow and one second of red which is another four seconds, so that's 30 seconds. So if I wanted to place my PED2 on recall, I will want to make sure that this max value is 30 seconds or higher. If not, your controller is going to run in transition and it's going to try to steal the time it needs to serve that PED from another phase. Generally speaking for CBD areas, if you're not in a CBD area, the, the two instances where I've seen where they'll run fixed time operation, is construction. A lot of times during construction you're doing a lot of traffic moves and you may not have detection when you're moving you know eastbound traffic over to the westbound lanes and they're sharing that while you're doing some work or if you just have somewhere where your detection is failing and you need a fix until you get your new equipment in. It's sometimes it's actually easier to coordinate multiple intersections when it's fixed time because you know that my cross street is gonna come up every cycle. It's always gonna get this amount of green. Um, the coordination is more really dealing with the offsets. So if you were to do that, instead of using your, uh, your max greens, what you'd wanna do is go to main menu and you would have to set up basically a, a schedule and coordination plans. So whether it's fixed time or not, this is kind of the same process. So you would go to number five schedule and um, number two, event plan. So when you get to event plan, one thing that Econolite has done with EOS that's different from NEMA softwares in the past is when you set up your schedule, you used to have a day plan, would call an action plan, which would call a chord pattern, which would call a split pattern, which would call a split plan. Econolite did away with all that, made it easier. So now your day plan calls an event plan, and that's it. So if you go to the event plan, you see here where it says type, you could toggle through there. You have chord, free, flash, and auto. So if you want to set up coordination, you go to chord, and then the screen changes and brings up all the menus you need to set up coordination. Your first one that I, I usually point out to people that's really important is this actuated chord. What actuated chord means in an Econolite controller if it's on no, it means your coordinated phase, the PEDs that are associated with the coordinated phases are gonna come up every single cycle whether somebody presses the button or not. So I always tell everybody to put that on yes. So you don't have those PEDs coming up every cycle. Uh, next thing you do is you go over here and you put in your cycle length. How long you want basically from, say start a green for phase one, it serves all the phases at the intersection and comes back to phase one. How long is that time? Uh, we'll put in 90 seconds here. And then this is the biggest important part for coordination is offset value. So offset is telling your controller um, in my cycle length, where am I going to set my local zero to? So basically, where do I start? So we'll leave this zero. But let's just say if we had an intersection, this would be intersection A, and we're starting to offset at zero. My next intersection is... 15 seconds down the road if I drive. Most likely, I would set that offset to 10. That way, the light turns green while traffic gets there and they don't have to stop. They keep flowing. And then you just kind of, you know, gradually go on down the corridor like that. Uh, underneath this, you have splits. We'll just throw some numbers in here. I put 15 for one. 
I'm gonna put 15 for two. And reason why I did that is you see it brings up this warning where I spoke earlier about the pet time, you having to have enough green to cover it. When you're doing coordination, you can actually put a split that's lower than the time you need for your pet. That's called a oversized pet. Um, that's very, very common on side streets because a lot of times you don't need a lot of green for side street, but because the main arterial is so wide, you need a huge amount of time for the pet crossing. Um, we'll just keep going here. I'll put 15 there and then I'm gonna do 45. One thing you notice is that right here where it says equal sign underneath the splits, as I was doing that, it totaled up the splits for me. So you wanna make sure that this total and that cycle length up there always match. If they don't match, your controller will run in transition because you've programmed splits longer than the cycle length you're asking for. Or if you did less, it'd be less than you're asking for. So I'll continue to put uh, numbers in here. After that, the next option you have is chord phase. So now that I have splits, offset, cycle length in my controller, it wants to know what chord phase am I supposed to run or what phases are the chord phases. So for here, I'm gonna say four and eight. Usually in Texas, text dot standardizes where two and six is always the chord phase. But you have other agencies that like to do their phasing by direction. So for example, Houston did two was eastbound, six was westbound, eight was north, four was south. So it didn't matter where you were, you always use those directions and just whatever street was the major, that's what you mark as chord. But text dot always does two and six is the chord phase. Um, if you toggle down further here, um, this max transition is another feature that's unique to EOS that I really like. Um, what this does, it's set at four as a default because in their ASC3 software, that's the way this works. So if your controller was supposed to be running a chord plan and went into transition for four cycles, then on the fifth cycle, it would say that the controller failed coordination and it forced it to go free. Well, they made this feature programmable now. So you could put any number all the way up to 99 or what I mostly do is put zero. If you put zero, that says no matter how many consecutive cycles I run transition, I'm never gonna fail cord and go free. So a lot of our customers have Centrax. If your controller's running in transition, you can see that on Centrax. And the reason why I do that is if that happens, I feel like you should see that on Centrax. That should be your alert to go out there and fix the problem. But at least I'm still trying to run coordination. So I have a chance that I may still line up with the signals on either side of me. If I fail and go free, then I know I'm probably introducing a hard stop into that corridor. Once you get your event plan set up, and we just did a cord one here, um, I'm also gonna tell it to run sequence one. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here and do an event plan two, and I will set that as a free plan. So once you do that and you have all your event plans set up, you need to go in there and make what is called a day plan, which is number three on here. So you have to tell the controller, what time do I want those events to come on and off? So I'm gonna tell my controller right now at midnight, I want it to run my event two, which was my free plan. Then I want event one, which was my core plan to kick in at 6 a.m. And the hour here is in military time. So if you go in the p.m., for example, one would be 1300, you add 12. Uh, and then I'm going to say I want my free plan 2 to come back on at 8 p.m., which would be 20 hundred hours. So I've set up my day plan. So now my controller knows, okay, I want event plan 2 to come on at midnight, then event plan 1 to come on at 6 a.m., and go back to event plan 2 at 8 p.m. After you do that, you hit submenu, and you go to schedule now. So now you got to let the controller know, when to run that day plan. So for schedule one, I'm gonna tell it to run day plan one. And what I usually do is I keep my schedule numbers and my day plan numbers one to one, just to make it easy. So if I was, had a day plan two, I would set that up with schedule two. So the first option you have here is selecting what months of the year this day plan is gonna run. If you just want it to run all months, the dot right next to all months, if you hit a zero and press enter, it auto selects every month of the year for you. 
Now you do days of the week. So a lot of agencies will do Monday through Friday as schedule one, and then schedule two will be the weekends, and they run different plans. Um, just here for training purposes, we're just gonna do every day of the week. And then it asks you what day of the month. And we're gonna select every day of the month. So now if we go back to status, you should see we're running event plan one, timing one. Before, we were just in default free. So now that we've set up a schedule, the controller is going to try to run the schedule. And if I go in here and change the time, I made it 1 a.m., you'll see that we're in event plan two because event plan one doesn't kick on until 6 a.m. Coordination, the different options that you have that you mentioned, coordination, fixed time, and free, uh, the difference between them really is more between coordination and free. So you could be running coordinated and also have a fixed time controller. Just because you're fixed time doesn't mean that you're not coordinated. Uh, the difference between coordination and fixed time is more of whether I'm what they call actuated, so I'm working off of detectors. So if you have an intersection that has good working detection, a lot of times you will do what we did in event plan one where we made four and eight the cord phase. So those two phases are guaranteed to come up every single cycle and get their full split. If there's no demand anywhere else, the controller will rest in green on four and eight. If we have fixed time, then the controller is going to cycle around every, every cycle. But you can still be coordinated running fixed time. As I previously mentioned, that's what we did downtown in Houston. Uh, so that's kind of the difference between cord and, well, not cord, but free and fixed time. If you're free, your intersection is basically just running off a of demand. So it's serving whatever phase the detector is telling the controller has demand. And when that demand goes back away, it's going back to whatever phases were programmed as rest phases, or it'll just sit in the last phase it served until it gets demand on a new approach. Actuated is a term that traffic engineers use to just say that we're running off a of detection. So instead of having a recall and being served every single cycle, you're actuated. So when I have demand, I serve it. When I don't, I don't. Well, it's really quarter free. Like I said, if you're running coordination, you can be fixed time or actuated. Some people do do a program flash, but that's not as common anymore. A lot of agencies are getting away from it. One reason to use a program flash is if you're in a rural area, let's say, you know, a small town, your main street's really, really packed during the day, but at night you have hardly any traffic. A lot of agencies will make the main street flash yellow, so those cars just keep going and the side streets flash red. And that'd be like a nighttime hour thing, like uh, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. and then you start running. But a lot of agencies I've seen are getting away from that program flash. Um, I know Tech Corpus Christi still uses it, but there's not many agencies that use program flash anymore. Setting up emergency vehicle preemption in a controller, there is actually a preemption menu. So from the main menu, you go to number four, and then you go to number one for your preempt plan. Uh, the EOS controller has up to 12 preempt plans that you can uh, configure. They're all defaulted to be off. Uh, what you have here, these first two lines are track vehicle, track overlap. That deals with heavy rail, so if this was set up for a railroad. So for EVP, you could skip over that. Um, you would go down here, and where you have dwell vehicle, you would tell the controller, whenever I get my emergency vehicle preempt request, what phases do I want to be green? So here, I'm going to set up two, and I will do five, because five is usually the left turn associated with phase two. So you have two and five set as your dwell vehicle. Underneath there, there's an option to dwell a ped. Most people don't use that. And then uh, dwell a overlap. If you had an overlap that needed to be active, that's there. You can go down here, you have exit phases. So you can tell it once my preempt request goes away, where do I want my controller to go to next? If you leave it blank, the controller will go to the phases it thinks it needs to go to in order to get into a uh, step the fastest. Because as I mentioned previously, emergency vehicle preemption stops the coordinator. So at that point, you're not running coordination. So once it drops back out, you're trying to get back into coordination. 
Most of the time I recommend leaving that blank so the controller can do his job and try to get back into step as quick as possible. Um, after you get that set, you go down here and you have some timing options. Uh, one of the most important one here is this ped clear. It's defaulted to 255 and what that does is it tells the controller if I'm serving a pedestrian clearance when I get my preemption, I'm either going to let that clearance be active for 255 seconds or the amount of time that's left on that clearance. For emergency vehicle preemption, what most people do is called truncating the PEDs. So basically when you get that emergency vehicle preemption request, you kill the pedestrian right away. So you can serve the emergency vehicle preemption uh, quickly. So you put that on zero. And the effect that would have in the street is if I'm crossing the street and my PED signal tells me I still have 15 seconds of countdown left, the controller gets the request for EVP, my countdown will go from 15 to zero. And like I said, that is a common practice. Uh, Texas MUTCD allows for it. Um, you may just want to check with your, your state if your MUTCD has provisions that, that may advise against it. But like I said, this is a common practice in Texas. Um, underneath that, you have what's called min duration. So what that does is it's saying if this request comes in, what is the minimum amount of time this request has to be active or the controller has to serve it? I usually use 10 for a good rule of thumb. And then the next feature I'll do is max call. And that's the maximum amount of time the controller is going to allow this call to be active. And what I usually make this equal to is whatever my highest cycle length is. So when I set up my coordination plan, if my highest cycle length was 150, I do 150. And the, the theory behind that is I'm going to allow my traffic controller to be hung up in EVP for up to one full cycle. And then after that, I'm going to drop the request and go back to running traffic as I normally would. And this is important because legacy preemption products, you had, for example, you know, an optical emitter. A lot of times they would turn that on to run to an accident, get to the accident, and the emergency personnel are in life-saving mode. So they hop out of the truck, they go to work on the accident or whatever is going on, they never turned off their strobe. So now they lock up the intersection. So this allows that to drop. Fortunately, with the newer preemption products, like applied information, y'all have stuff in your preemption that lets us know, even though they're active, they open the door. So shut the preemption request off. So as preemption is getting smarter, this number may not be needed as much, but I put it in there because not, not everybody has upgraded. So for the pet clear part, if you were forced to do a pet clear, I would make that number equal to the longest pet clearance I had at the intersection. So you usually have four PEDs, two, four, six, and eight. Let's say PED eight had a 20 second clearance. I would put 20 seconds in there. And theory behind that is if I have to allow for the PED to clear, I want to make sure that all the PEDs I have at the intersection will be able to clear their full clearance. So if an EVP hit it as soon as phase eight's walk was starting, phase eight would still get his full 20 seconds of clearance. Okay, so you're different in preemption inputs. Um, a wired input, you would do the settings I just said, you would enable it, and that wires into the cabinet on the back panel. So you have a electrical connection, when it sees voltage, it becomes hot, and it gives the call to the controller, and you would see that come active down here where your dot is on preempt. 1202, you're doing it through Ethernet. We're actually setting this up for Tex.Houston, right now in the Houston area. So you have your Ethernet cable that's plugged in here. We're using Enet2 when we do that. And that goes into the applied information FMU08502. And once the FMU gets the preamp call, it sends it to the controller through the Ethernet on NTCIP. Um, the other way to 
do that would be with uh, your SCP plans and setting those up is a little more tedious than preemption just because um, we set up a strategy plan earlier. Once you get done doing that strategy plan, you actually have to go in here and we mentioned before how SCP can shrink the green or it can extend the green in order to help the intersection get to where it needs to be to meet the ETA. So for every event plan that you have, you would have to go in here and put in those numbers of how many seconds you could reduce the green, how many seconds you can increase the green, and what you want that minimum split for that green to be when you're in SCP. So if you were running a chord pattern and you had eight different chord plans, you'd have to go in here and set up eight different SCP patterns. And these do work one to one. So this pattern one would correlate with event pattern one. Anything you do on preemption is considered the highest priority level. If you use number one preemption, you're, you're the highest class. And then when you go in there, I mentioned before you have uh, up to 12 different preemption plans. Those have a hierarchy too. So one will trump any other preemption and 12 is the lowest priority. So if you had a emergency vehicle that was using preempt 12 and this intersection also had a train track, which was preempt one, if that preempt 12 was active and a train came, it would drop preempt 12 and go to preempt one. Uh, SCP, the priority is a lower level. So the priority will operate as long as there's not a preemption call. If you get a preemption call, it's gonna kick priority out and do the EVP or the heavy rail. Harris County actually does that right now. They're using uh, SCP for their emergency vehicles because they didn't want preemption, like I said before, the preemption kicks out the coordinator and a lot of times you get disruption to your cord plans. So Harris County uses a kind of like controllers and they use the SCP function in order to give preemption to the emergency vehicles there. They don't have any preemption programmed in their controller, so there's nothing that has a higher level of priority programmed in the controller to trump that. The main benefit for the traffic department using SCP over hard preemption would be the fact that you are, if you have a coordinated corridor, a really busy street, like the major street in your city, whenever that emergency vehicle comes down there, especially if there's a fire department that has a, a, uh, a building on that street, they may get several calls a day. So if you're using hard preemption, every time that truck goes out there with the lights on, every signal on your corridor just got preempted, you drop coordination, you're gonna be in transition most likely for about two cycles before you get back into step. It's a big disruption for traffic. If you're using SCP, you're gonna stay in coordination, you're not gonna get in transition, you're gonna still be running cord so your cars can flow, you're just stretching and shrinking those greens to get the vehicle through at the right time. It's very important for SCP to have a second by second ETA. And reason being, like I said, what the controller does is it will shrink side streets greens to get back to the main street. Or sometimes if the ETA is far away, it may shrink the main street to serve the side street real quick so it can get back to the main street. If that ETA isn't accurate, the controller doesn't know what it needs to do as far as manipulating those green times to get to the approach it needs to get the vehicle through the intersection. So if you didn't have a second by second, you know, you could give me a 30 second ETA, controller starts preparing for that, and five seconds later I update and vehicle move faster than I thought 10 seconds, I don't have time to make his approach green before he arrives. TSP or SCP is what they call it in the Econolite controller. I mentioned previously it differs from main preemption because it does not kick your your timing out of coordination. It has a lower priority than preempt also. When you go to setting it up, which let me just, from the main menu that is four, three. That way you know where I'm at on the controller. When you go to setting it up, as I mentioned earlier, you would go in here and you would set your, your strategy plan. So what we've been doing so far is a full eight phase intersection. 
So I would turn on all eight phases here. That way my SCP plan can manipulate times on all eight phases to meet the ETA of the vehicle that I'm dealing with. And then I always go to the obstructing phases. And for one, that phase one usually works with six. So I'll put in six. And I do the same thing for the throughs. I'll put in their associated left turn. And that's just to help with spillback. So if I have a SCP plan where I'm trying to get a fire engine through phase two, I don't want spillback from my left turn bay on phase five uh, encroaching my phase two traffic and stopping them from going. So I would pretty much run through here and set this up for every phase. So it has its associated through or it's associated left turn. And then after that, you would go in there to your split pattern and you would set up what you want to reduce your green by, extend your green by, and what you want the green split to be during that SCP pattern. If anything in the controller ever gets a little difficult when you're timing it, one thing that Econolite does have is a really, really good help menu. So if you hover over any option and you're saying, you know, I really don't know what that option does. If you hit the help menu, it brings up a menu that has a little brief description. Sometimes they're longer, but these are really helpful. I actually use these from time to time when I'm messing with new features that I don't know about. But this is one thing that I do show in all of my trainings, because if you, you know, want to try to figure something out yourself and you don't necessarily want to have to try to call somebody, this help menu is great. And if you hit help, it takes you right back to where you were before you decided to hit the help to see the help menu. The difference between the pulsed input and the 1211, the, the major difference is 1211 you're going through NTCIP, usually through an ethernet cable. The pulsed input is gonna be something that's hardwired into the back of the cabinet. So you would have your, your back panel on your TS2 cabinet, you have preemption input uh, screws there are places where they're allotted to wire that to. You'd have to wire that there. Um, personally, I like the 1211 better just because it's less stuff to wire in my preempt, I mean, in my cabinet, and it's less points of failure. So if you are wiring in a hardwire preemption system, most traffic signals have four approaches. That's four wires. So I have four different points of failure, you know, I could have one approach go bad or something to where if I'm using 1211, I have one ethernet cable. So to map a, um, a detector as a priority input or a priority detector, in EOS, it's easy. You actually have a SCP detector option. So you can go in here and map your detectors. But you did mention the legacy software ASC3 and the way that I would achieve that is I would do what is called a logic statement. So from the main screen, you would go to one five and then you go to number two and you would set up a logic statement there. So you had mentioned detector 33. So what I would do here is on this if column, you press enter and it gives you a full array of options that you can use on the logic processing. So forgive the loud beeping, but I would go down there to where I have detector. So I would hit enter. So there I'm saying if detector 33 is on, then and you tell the controller what you want it to do. So this uh, logic menu has a lot of the more frequently used uh, options available. Uh, Econolite also has a, a chart that they give out that's kind of like in the back of their manual. I have an electronic copy of it that has other, what they call special function bits that do other um, functions that aren't listed here. And I believe SCP is going to be one of those special function bits. So we may not be able to set this. 
pretty much that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, hey, when detector 33 is on, then place a SCP detector one call. And you save that, and then you go back here to logic statement control, and you do an E to enable that logic statement. So the controller knows that it needs to use that logic statement. Setting up a, a kind of like controller to do SPAT and have connected vehicle functionality. Um, first thing is this controller has to communicate. So you need to set up the IP address. You're going to go to 121 and you have your IP address options here. Uh, the default is 1070 1051. That's what just it is coming out of the box. If you needed to change that, let's say, for example, we're going to go to 10 one, like I said, this is another major change. I would just hit F so I could keep going. But let's just say that we're going to change our second octet to one for all of our IP addresses. You change that, you hit special function and enter. Now, for the Battelle spat, you actually have to load a script into the controller. So um, you use the laptop, you connect through Ethernet, and you have to make sure that your laptop is on the same network as the controller. So what we have here is we have the 10.1.10.51 that we programmed in there for our ENET1, which is this two port switch here. And then you also have an ENET2, which is this 72.30.30.30. That's hard coded, you can't change that IP address. But that operates these, this two port ethernet switch here at the bottom, which is labeled ENET2. Since I'm already plugged into ENET2, and my laptop set up for it, I'm going to use ENET2 to do that. But in order to do that, you would bring up the um, script for the SPAT. You would enter in the IP address of where you want to send it. Since we're in ENET2, I want my SPAT to talk on that IP address. And that is the default IP address here. So I could just hit enter. It's asking me the controller's port. This is defaulted for a Conolite, so it says 501 already. I'd hit enter, and then it's asking me the SPAT type. Uh, it's defaulted for type 6, which is all of your SPAT information and includes the PEDs. So I'll just hit enter, and then it runs that script. It shows that it's working, and it shows it's successful. Sometimes you have to power cycle the controller in order to see on glance that it's actually reporting SPAT. Sometimes you don't. So after that step, I would refer to my glance page, go into that FMU, and see its network status. If it's showing spats all good, or if it's saying um, no spat, then I'd probably have to power cycle the control. The server IP address also has to be set when you're using AI units. So one of these addresses will actually be the FMU address, and the other one will be the, the rabbit. So you have one that you're using for your controller. You have your server IP that would be set up for your rabbit and your default gateway. And these will be given to you by your applied information sales engineer. They usually give you a chart uh, if you're on the routed network that you get from them. Or if you're on the city's network, you would have got this from the agency. Once you have these set up, if you wanted to do a quick check in the field to make sure that they're working correctly, you could go to main menu, go to number seven status, number one controller, I'm sorry, number five communications, number one ethernet. And if you can reach the gateway IP and you can reach the server IP, both of these uh, no's would say yes. And up here, you would see that your RX and your TX count are similar and you have no error counts. So that's a quick sanity check for you after you do all your IP programming and you have your ethernet plugged in, everything's powered up, say hey, let me see if I'm actually talking to the IP addresses that I programmed in here I need to talk to. A lot of people believe server IP is the IP address of the central main server. Using applied information products, that is not correct. Like I said, you're going to get your routed network IP addresses from your sales engineer, or if you're doing it on the city's network, the city will provide some and AI will have that worked out. They will still provide that to you, but it'll be a city's IP address and not an AI routed network that was set up. If you have a traffic controller that's failed in the field, that's 
kind of a broad question. And the reason why is just there's many reasons a traffic controller can fail. But let's just say I'm at a cabinet and I suspect the problem is the controller itself. And I know the programming's good, but I think, you know, maybe I'm not outputting, so maybe the controller I.O. is bad or whatever. Um, one simple step you could do to get a new controller and get that powered up to run it would be, as I mentioned before, using a USB to save the timing file. So you could put a USB stick in here. Um, you can give the controller a few minutes. It should recognize the stick and go straight to the options for you. So I can tell it that I want to save from this controller. If you select number three, save from controller, and then number one to save the CFG, which is the configuration file. And then it brings up all the folders that you have on the USB. You can pre-name folders and save them in here so you can have a folder for every intersection. If you're gonna do a lot of file saving without a laptop, I recommend that because the way that it names a file is a bunch of string of numbers. So if you did several, you may not know which intersection it goes to. So you select your folder, you hit the one key, and then it saves it. So it tells me that it successfully saved that file in that folder. Once you pop this in your new controller, and I'm manually going to the options just because I haven't pulled this out and put it back in. So from the main menu, it's 8.2 to get to the USB options. You just say configuration update, and then you pick the file that you want to use. So that would get a new controller up and going if your old controller could still power up and you want to save the timing file to try to get it up. If you don't suspect it's the controller, I would go number seven status, number seven cabinet, and number one flash. This menu tells you why the controller thinks you're in flash, which doesn't always align with the MMU. Uh, one instance I can tell you of that is what I spoke about earlier when we have to go 114 to copy the cabinet permissives. If you forgot to do that, your cabinet would be in flash. When you look at your MMU, it would show CVM is the reason for flash, which means the controller is telling me to go to flash. So you wouldn't get what you need from the MMU. But if you went to the controller, in that case, the controller would say permissive mismatch. So now you know where to go. So this is a helpful screen. Um, if you hit submenu number two, this communication is also another helpful screen trying to troubleshoot while you're in flash. What this does is it shows you your frame errors on your SDLC bus. So your MMU, right now this says 10 because we're not connected to one. If you have a good running MMU, you shouldn't have any frame errors. This should be zero. So if you were in flash and you looked here and this said 10, that would tell me there's something wrong with the SDLC communications between the MMU and the cabinet. It could be a bad SDLC cable, it could be a bad SDLC port on the MMU, but that would at least tell you where to look inside the cabinet to troubleshoot. Underneath it, this TFBIU1 and TFBIU2, those are your terminal facility BIUs, the ones where SDLC cables plug into, and they pretty much feed information to the back panel on the load switches. Same thing with those, they should be a zero. If they're 10, they've gone bad, and that would let you know I need to replace a BIU. So for example, if I'm in flash, my MMU is zero, my TFBIU is 10, my TFBIU2 is zero, looking at this screen would quickly let me know that BIU number one is bad, I need to swap that BIU. Back to where we were initially setting it up, if you know what load switch is associated with what phase, you would go one one, just like you're doing a normal cabinet, Go to number one, select your cabinet type. Go to number two, make sure your load switch assignment is right so I know what phase is what load switch. And then after that, you could go from there to two, one, six, place a recall on every phase if you, know, you didn't have detection either. And from that point, uh, one, one, four, copy the permissives this should be able to run, but it'd be running with the Econolite default numbers, so that may be something you wanna look at, especially for your yellow and red clearances, because the defaults are three seconds, which is the minimum allowed yellow, and one second for the red. So that may not be what you need for your intersection, but that would get you running colors. Dynamic Max 
you would go from the main menu number two, number one, and you could go to number three. I personally like using number nine. And what the difference between these screens is, is in the legacy software, ASC3, when you went to your timing plan options, you had this big screen that listed like every option and you just toggle down, toggle down. The earlier versions of EOS, they decided to get rid of that and break that into several different screens. A lot of people complained about that. So they brought the big screen back, which is the summary screen. That's the one I like to use, but you could go here, like I said, to number three. I just like using the summary screen. That's what I'm used to. So you go down there to that summary screen, and you would go down here to where you have your dynamic max values. So once you get to your dynamic max values, you can set your dynamic max. So let's say for phase one, I'm going to make it 45 seconds and then you set a step. So this is how many seconds it's gonna increase the max as it steps up. So for here, I'm gonna say five. So my dynamic max can increase my max time by five seconds until it gets to 45 seconds. And what you would have to do after that would be when you're in your event plan, five, two, you scroll down here you have a selection where it asks you what max value are you using. So you would have to go in there and do max inhibit and then you select Okay, no, I'm sorry. You just program it on the timing screen. Some of the earlier versions had dynamic max as one of the selections but you just program it on the timing screen where we were just at. My name is Tito Escobar. Thank you for watching this training. If you ever have any questions with the controller, if you don't have an Econolite rep in your area, reach out to your AI sales engineer. They could get you in contact with me. I have no problem fielding phone calls or emails to answer questions about the controller or timing.